get it. So welcome to today's class where the topic is how is echo space. And uh, let me see if I can pull up a presentation here. So my suggestion is that we uh, we start talking, we, we talk about what's in this presentation about echo space. You watch the uh, YouTube describing it. Uh, I also think we should talk a little bit about the habitat capacity paper. And after we've done that, time allowing, open up echo space and look at how the uh, how we work with the echo space model. We may not be able to do the entire tutorial, but you have uh, you you you've seen the video with the tutorial, so I don't think that's really important. But I'm probably the the one who is least capable of judging what's really important. So it's re really up to you to help guide that this process. So please, are there any questions about this? Is it straightforward, moderately complicated, or very complicated? Please. I had a question about um, stuff from Ecosim that doesn't travel into Ecospace. That has confused that was, a lot of people. Yeah. Um, because. One of the things that doesn't travel is the forcing functions. So um, I guess in, in, in order to run a model where say different, different life stages would have a different preference for temperatures. So you'd say find a juvenile life stage in colder waters and an adult life stage for whatever reason. Would you then create them as separate groups in your model instead of multi stanza groups because I remember last class you were saying that the multi stanza group just takes the predominant life stage. Mm, that was uh, quite a few things you you got into that into this question here. So let's try to take them a little bit in order. Um, the first thing about what. What, tra what, uh, what travels from uh, ecosim to echo space? What can we transfer that? And what we can transfer are the things that are not spatially explicit or for which there is a model to distribute them spatially. So if we take a thing, if we take a thing like, if we take a, a driver, a momentum driver, like temperature, um, if we just have a temperature, that the temperature in the state of Georgia has increased two degrees over the last 30 years, as we've seen from uh, surface temperature recordings or something like that. So in principle, you could just run it with, okay, we, drop, we just drop that uniform temperature on it. We know that's not correct, that in the in, in state of Georgia, there's a big variation, temperature is really dynamic. Um, so why would you use a spatial model with the same temperature? You know, you're complicating quite, things quite a lot if you just use the same temperature everywhere. So why a spatial model in that case? Why don't you just look at an echo sim? Um, if you look at the YouTube videos from last year, you will see um, a video with Natalia Sapetti who looked at temperature impacts west of Scotland, a nice paper, non-spatial. She used EcoSim and she used temp had temperature driving it in there and then looked at the implications, but non-spatially, and th that makes sense. But if she had done the same with a spatial model, it would have made much less sense. So temperature and those, those things that are really are, should be spatially explicit, we do not carry them over from EcoSim to EcoSpace. The things we carry over are those where we uh, that are not spatially explicit. Mediation function, mediation and mediation functions are examples of this. Mediation is something that's impacted by, you know, someone impacting a predator-prey interaction, and we can apply that mechanism 
in the spatial model. Uh, effort is another one where there is a model in space that distributes the effort over the space. That's a model called the gravity model, which Carl was involved in developing in the last century. And uh, I think believe he's going to he's going to come come here if I'm wrong about this, but I believe that uh, John Caddy uh, picked it up and and ran with John Caddy, who was a scientist at FAO, now retired. Um, and that model is uh, working really well. It's based on the fact that fishers are pretty smart. So fishing effort is distributed where it makes most sense from a fisher's point of view, which is where catches are highest relative to cost. So that's what the model looks for. So the assumption is if there is a, a aggregation of fish somewhere, the fishers will find them. And uh, the distributions that come out of that model have shown to be pretty good. So that we can distribute spatially. If we just know how many boats there are, we can distribute them spatially. That's fine. Can I, I think that covers there? what? Jump in there a little bit. Else? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, um, you got yeah, that backwards about John Caddy. It was uh, John was the first one to use the so-called gravity model to predict spatial effort distributions. The 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 what were our effort distributions are uh, using what's called a, a logic choice model uh, on uh, assuming that people choose things are more likely to choose places to go uh, in a way that varies with the logarithm of abundance and, and you can set a power thing to make the effort be more concentrated to be more like what's called an ideal free distribution of effort where they're putting their effort at the best places only. Uh, the uh, this business about whether to uh, uh, split uh, to to get to drop the multi stanza groups when you go to eco space that's a bad idea because uh, very often what we're looking for is issues that happen at one life stage that then impact later life stages and if so if you if you take away the multi stanza accounting you take away that impact. Like if something nails the little ones, you want it to nail the big ones as well. And that won't happen if they're treated as independent biomass groups. Another thing is that uh, in, in, in relation to temperature specifically, uh, there is a fundamental problem with ecospace. It's a single layer model. It's actually an aerial model rather than a, than a three-dimensional model with it doesn't have you can put depths in but it doesn't have the option in it for organisms to vary their depth distributions and, and that seems to be the main way that animals deal with uh, non-optimal temperatures it is not to go somewhere else but to stay in the same area but to move into deeper water which very often means impairment in their feeding, especially if they're visual feeders. Uh, they can't see their prey if they're pushed down into deeper water. Uh, and so it, uh, it, it's, it's a basic issue in, as to what temperature is affecting. Right? And you can model this a little bit by having a temperature mediation. Uh, mediating the, the foraging rate. So if they're at lower temperatures, uh, feed at lower rates, but we don't feed temperature in as a spatial depth variable. So it just, there's a whole bunch of vertical ecology that we aren't dealing with at all in the ecospace structure, except through the way it creates foraging arena patterns vertical foraging arena patterns. There is, um, there is a, some trade-offs here. And you have to remember that the simplest model that can be used to address the question tends to be the best model. And 
if we were to go three-dimensional, um, there is an enormous overhead. It's so much mm. more complex to keep track of. Mm. Yeah, one, uh, yeah, one, one more little thing here is that the original development of Ecospace, my aim was only to evaluate spatial closure policies. So all the equation structure and so on, the basic Ecospace setup was just aimed at calculating uh, long-term average or equilibrium effects of closing of clo spatial closure patterns of MPAs, right? And all of the things that people we've tried to do since to make it a time dynamic model as well as, uh, as dealing with spatial closures. They've all been to some degree incomplete. So it, it, it isn't that Ecospace really reproduces Ecosim at a jillion grid points with mixing between areas. It only does that partially and, and it, it doesn't do the time the dynamic calculations as well as Ecosim does when there's a time forcing of various kinds. It's a compromise. Yeah. And th there has been a number of additions since that uh, 97 or 99 first uh, version of it. And we'll talk of some of those, but the uh, we're not going to be talking much about the temporal spatial framework here, which is which was developed by Jerome Steinbeck and still is being developed by Jerome Steinbeck. Now, that temporal spatial framework allows us to read in layers for each time step. We can read in new data file, new data file, new data file, new data file. And it actually works really well. It's been running now for five, six, seven, eight years, something like that. And um, one of the things that it allows us to do is, for instance, to read in a button temperature, uh, you can have a, a surface temperature and then you can let the demersal fish be impacted by the bottom temperature and the and, uh, politics by the surface or by the intermediate or, or, or whatever you think is the appropriate. It's a simplification. It's pragmatic. It actually works pretty well. Generally, if you can find a simpler way, a simple way of addressing a question, that, that's good. And there really is an enormous overhead in doing 3D modeling. If you do 3D, you have to keep track of everything that moves in three dimensions, and that is complicated. It calls for, for, for small time steps as well. And um, it's, if we went in that, that if, if we had gone in that, if we'd done it that way, the model one was, would be so slow that you can't play with them. And it's when you play with them, you really learn about how things work. So um, it, it's a balance, it's a trade-off. What we are increasingly doing is to couple or link hydrodynamic, 3D hydrodynamic models to the 2D aerospace model. 2D, 2D with kind of an implicit third dimension by pulling in bottom temperature or surface temperature or other factors that relate to the third dimension. You can't explicitly model that, oh, a whale will go from the surface down to the bottom and back up again uh, in a time step or, or many times in a time step. Um, but is it, when is that important? You have to go back to your research question. What are your research questions? If they rely a lot on modeling the dynamics of, of virtual migration. This is not the right model for that. Then you have to have a model that has that, or you have to make your 2D so that it's a transect. Then you can do it. Are people doing that? They, they flip the model so that uh, it's from surface to bottom, and then you only model. You still model only those, still a 2D model, but you, you, you use that to model those, the vertical fluxes. That's feasible. And it's simpler to do it with a transect than it to do it with a full 3D. So you really have to be go back again and again and again and again to your research question. 
that's what have to drive the modeling type. Find the simplest model that can address those questions and, and run with that. All right. Other issues? I have another question. Um, in the recording, they, they, well, I think it's actually Marta who mentions it, that there is that tool to weight the different uh, functional responses when there is different functional responses within a um, functional group. Well, there is different species within a functional group to get like a, um, a function for the group. But I think she said that that wasn't developed last year. Is that included now or? Um, I don't know. Yes, I know. I think it is actually, but it's not included in, in the version we're sitting with here or working with here. Uh, this is a facility that relates to a global ocean model called Echo Ocean that Martin and I have, and, and colleagues have been working with for, for, for a very long time. We are on the, I think we're on the third or fourth generation of that model. So that's a model that's uh, part of this TRISMIP corporation that I have mentioned before, a model in the comparison project, where there are a number of global ecosystem models that are being used to address questions related to climate change. So in an, an echo ocean, there are a couple of papers about that, which you can find one I'm lead, lead author on from 2014-15 and one Marta from 2020, if you want to read more about it. But this is a big spatial ecosystem model, aerospace model, with something like 49 functional groups. And within each of these 49 or so functional groups, certainly for the fish species, we have extracted from, echo, from um, based on aqua maps that we talked about, um, we've extracted distributions so that we know for each spatial cell, for instance, large demersal piscivores or whatever it might be, these groups, width of these, there may be hundreds of species that uh, fall into that functional group. For many of those, we can then get from aqua maps the functional response curve. And what she's talking about Amara was talking about was a mechanism for what do we do when we have a hundred functional response, temperature responses, how do we get that into making it one for the group that we can run with an echo space? Uh, and that mechanism is one that we've been working on for how do we get more together? And then how do we, the first question that arises is if you have a hundred species in that functional group, uh, are, are we all equal or some more equal than others you know, in abundance? That uh, we we try different things. So there are some uh, there are ways there are ways of, of considering that, but that's what she was talking about. If you only it's, it's if you only have a few, I think that's also a recommendation that Marta gave. That if you only uh, you may have to do it in in, in Excel uh, right now, and, and I think that would be the way to handle this. If you do it in Excel, you have the chance of actually figuring out what goes on in a much better way than using some automated mechanism. Does it have a name just for like curiosity, like the, the tool? Okay. No, I think it's uh, it, it's definitely something you should talk to Marta and Jerome about because they it's Jerome who's been implementing this. So he actually knows more about the status. When you go home, <laughs> Pretty soon, yeah. All right. Um, are there other topics? Really? Yeah. <clears throat> um, you seem to highlight on the presentation that uh, dispersal is as important for spatial modeling as vulnerability for time dynamic models. And uh, I remember when we discussed the vulnerability uh, in understanding how far a group is from carrying capacity, does dispersal has the same uh, relation like vulnerability for 
uh, identifying how far the group is from carrying capacity or or not? Not. Okay. No, if you, in that, uh, when I was re-watching re that uh, YouTube here uh, in preparation for the class today, I thought it was a pretty neat demonstration in the in the tutorial. Of, uh, at the, or not even a tutorial because it was add on to a tutorial where at the end of it, I put in uh, a protected area and looked at what's the implication of that protected area for cod. And uh, ran the model closed fishery completely for cod and you could not see on the map for cod where the MPA was because the dispersal rates were 300 kilometers per year, which is a number, whereas the cell size was 20 kilometer, i.e. much, much smaller. So that for every month, the average cart would leave the cell, uh, leave the cell that was in the previous month. So everything was just would just be dispersal, dispersing out of there. This is really a critical question. And it's a critical question that has been uh, or should have been the focus for marine protected areas going back so many decades as they've been around. But it's really, really, really difficult to find numbers for those. And there's a spillover effect. There are lots of talk about spillover effect for marine protected areas. Um, there's also homing in, in, in play here. The, the fish in a marine protected area really knows where, where the borders are of the marine protected areas. Seen that diving around them, how you can see a wall of fish and that's inside the area and outside hardly any, but they know that they're protected in there. Fish are smart, but um, there still is dispersal out from there. It may be juveniles that disperse out. It may be random or feeding like movements and uh, whatever it is, but that is really important. And how uh, how we get a number for that? Carl, you you on yeah. mute yourself. Oh, uh, one one serious application of EcoSpace was to what was called the MLPA planning process. Uh, the state of California was one of the first places in North America to formally institute a network of marine protected areas along the California coast to mandate uh, the development of a network of marine protected areas scattered all up and down their coast. And they had a whole team of scientists come in and look at issues about where the protected areas should be, what their targets should be in terms of the size of the areas and number of areas and stuff like that. And when the smoke cleared amongst all the biologists' arguments, uh, and after uh, we ran ecospace models, what the ecospace models said was that about three quarters uh, or three, over three quarters of the total fish biomass off the California coast is in uh, species that either have active migratory behaviors or are highly dispersive. So all of their small pelagic species like sardines and things like that move around. Uh, larger things, uh, crabs even, and, uh, and many of their other important big fish stocks uh, move too much for protected areas to have any impact at all unless they were closing over half of the state's waters to fishing. And nobody wanted to do that. And when the biologists that had been advocating these protected areas were pushed into a corner about what they meant by protecting biodiversity. Uh, what they actually meant was not protecting biodiversity, but protecting a few long lived sedentary species that had been seriously impacted by fishing. So that was rock fishes. The, uh, several rockfish species that don't move around. Um, abalone that have very limited spatial movement and dispersal and had been severely over harvested off the California coast and a few other things like that. So that what they were actually advocating was not uh, 
M MPAs for ecosystem protection at all. They were just advocating MPAs for the creatures that they found interesting to study as biologists. It was really the ecospace modeling revealed this embarrassing business that there was this hidden agenda in the community of uh, ecologists, mainly from the University of California, Santa Barbara, who were driving the planning process as to where the MPA should be and how big they should be and so on. So there weren't any, for example, there weren't any mud bottom MPAs, weren't any protected areas over, over mud bottoms or sandy bottoms because almost all the fish on such bottoms move around quite a bit. So it was, uh, the ecospace results were uh, scrupulously ignored in, in the planning process and, uh, and in the process of comparing alternative MPA, uh, MPA configurations because it, uh, it made a joke out of their, uh, the difference between their real and their stated objectives. All right, thank you, Kong. Um, a bit of history, maybe. So when we started with Ecospace, we, we, we defined a number of habitats or habitat, it was habitat based in a way, we defined the habitats. There's an example on this graph here, which is from the Adriatic Sea. Can't remember if it's Marta Col or if it's Simone Lipolato. I can't even see it from down there. Um, from the down there being the, being the references. So you can see here there are these different habitats. Uh, 10 to 50 meter sand, mud sand, depth, so it's depth and, and bottom type and deeper. And then there is zero to 10 meter Croatia and Slovenia. So that's the coastal areas. And then obviously two countries, Croatia and Slovenia, there was very little information. So they are not, they are modeled separately somehow. But in any case, it's based on these habitats they are defined. And then for each group, it was defined how, whether it was good habitat or bad habitat. And we still changed that so you can, you can say that they, they are really like one habitat type and they like another habitat type, uh, half as much or 10% uh, compared to the other one, you know, that's what was good and bad. And then uh, that would be possible to, it was possible for the, um, for species that were ended up in bad habitat to move towards good habitats. And uh, it, it worked reasonably well. We've since added to this by using uh, something called habitat preference functions. I think let's go and have a look here. This is about, as you can see, you can see you can use habitats for each group. You can decide now whether you use uh, hold, hold on now. Yeah. You're, being, you're being way too vague here. When you say habitat preference, uh, or yeah, you say the fish like one place and not another, you have to make an operational definition of it. And what he's really talking about is not preference. What's being calculated here is the habitat capacity for the species. That's what we're going to down to now with the habitat capacity model, yeah. Right, yeah. So it's trying to set the K, the population carrying capacity, uh, by varying the the uh, the foraging arena parameters to limit it, its ability to build up in habitats that uh, it doesn't like. To put put it vaguely. So there are two ways of distributing it, kind of two models, and one can use one or the other or both. Um, so basically this habitat capacity model is asking why are the species where they are and then trying to explain that based on environmental conditions. So it's kind of like a species envelope modeling integrated with food web. The way it works, we talked about that when we talked about ecosim and our environmental parameters uh, is so that we can put in maps for instance, with temperature, and then for each cell, we can look at what is the uh, take number two could be temperature. There's an optimum temperature, and it doesn't like 
So x-axis is temperature. We will go in and for that cell, for any given cell, we will go in, look at what's the temperature, x2, and then read off this functional response here for temperature, uh, what that meant for habitat capacity. And we do that, when we do that for a number of, of functions, we can multiply this to, uh, we can multiply these factors with each other, and out of that come a cell habitat capacity value, which is then used to say how much foraging arena there is in, in that cell for that species. The, um, you know, before you go on here, Billy, you gotta be yeah. really careful here about uh, this business of habitat capacity, particularly in relation to things like temperature. Temperature generally is not expected to affect habitat capacity unless it restricts the places that fish can forage. And mm -hmm. actually, I think of an example of this in Canada, the highest carrying capacity in terms of biomass of freshwater uh, lake trout, which are uh, species that occurs all across Canada in large numbers. The highest biomasses are in the coldest lakes in the far north. So they build up huge biomasses there because they live for bloody ever. But they're extremely sensitive to fishing. And when you move further south, uh, biomasses are lower, but they're turning over a lot faster. So they're actually capable of withstanding a lot more fishing. So you gotta be careful about what you're, you're talking about here when you, when you talk about carrying capacity. Yeah. So that relates to the aquamaps we were talking about uh, last time when we, that we could extract for all species. Um, when we looked at that, for instance, for anchovy, it looked something like that they were okay from five degrees up to 20 degrees or just flat. Uh, which basically just means that, yeah, they are distributed over such a wide temperature range. It doesn't mean that they are as productive in, in, in those various uh, areas. This is a problem we really had with the global ecospace model, the eco-ocean model that we talked about before, where when we distribute things on the map, um, the, in the initial versions of it, we didn't have that uh, aspect that the biomasses would be higher in colder waters and turnover slower and vice versa in the warmer waters where the lower biomasses, but faster turnover. We've incorporated that now by using a Q10, um, which roughly says that for every 10 degrees uh, you increase temperature, uh, you double the metabolism. Carl is just about to um, jump in here again, but it has the, it has the effect that um, you will see a buildup of biomasses and slower turnover rates in the colder water and all others. So these things that can be added on top of this, the habitat capacity modeling here in, in, the, in the way that the aquamaps gives you that, yeah, it can be used for distributing them, but not getting the productivity aspect. Carl? Uh, no, no, that, that's okay. Yeah, I, th I think that's clear, should be clear to you. Oh, I okay. didn't raise my hand. Oh, maybe I not. Have a I have a question. Yeah. Or I think I just misunderstood it. So um, what Carl was saying is that normally you will not include temperature. We will not be no. completely correct to include temperature when you're doing a habitat capacity modeling. No, temperature is <laughs> We have to make do with what we can get of environmental parameters. And temperature is, is important. Um, the, the issue is less so on when you're looking at Strait of Georgia or Mediterranean Sea, you would, uh, you might find species are in a, in concentrated in the more narrow temperature band than what you have when you're looking at the whole area. And it can be useful for, for deriving it. The shape of these curves that you see here matters a lot for this. I mean, if it's, uh, if it is like we saw it from Anchory and it's just, a flat line from five to 25 degrees and you only have 10 to 10 to 15 degrees representing your model, then it's not useful. 
it won't tell you anything. So it, re it really depends on that, but we often, we often use it and it's often useful because there is, uh, having them as uh, wide as acromaps does acromaps. You know, it looks at the whole distribution of this species, uh, but this is not necessarily where the locally adapted anchovies occur. So if you, for instance, can derive the environmental preference functions from um, local sampling, you will get a total different picture. So I actually think it would be interesting to talk about a paper here. I mean, just the paper about this. Um, there's a neat aspect to that paper, kind of. Uh, let's see, I have it here. Uh, oh, I can't see it. It's hidden behind here. Oh, come on. You guys are in the way right now. That's because, oh, this thing. I'm trying to get. <laughs> I have, um, I have the, uh, come on, let me move. There we are. I just need to move this. So I, because you guys were in the way up there. Uh, here, that's this paper here. That's the one that describes that. The, uh, the habitat capacity model. An interesting aspect of this, which I actually think I would like Carl to talk about is We made a scheme for this paper uh, to test it. We, we did simulation testing, simulating model evaluation of it. So Carl, when people work with a model, how do you test a model? How do you make sure the model is actually doing uh, what it is? I think that the whole simulation modeling business is, is widely used now and you, I know you advocate it. Can you explain what, not, not how it's done here, but just uh, generally about simulation modeling to test models, how that works? To test models, so, uh, are, are, you, are you asking, you know, you're not being clear about what you mean by test the model. The one, one way to, to answer that question is to say, does the model do what you tried to tell it to do, mm -hmm. which has nothing to do with mother nature? And, and that, that's just oh. a matter of uh, looking at the outputs of the model to see if it does exhibit the patterns that you thought you were telling it to exhibit. And that's actually a pretty serious problem with uh, with models like EcoSpace is that very often the, the model structure is constrained in ways that don't permit it to make the predictions you thought you were telling it to make. Like just low vulnerability multipliers, for example, will not allow populations to recover to higher levels when you stop fishing them. Okay, so. That, that's one issue. Uh, yeah. the, other, the other testing issue, the other way to think about testing is uh, whether or not you can determine the model to be consistent with historical observations of variation. That's, that's the model fitting, so-called model fitting business. And now the, the basic problem here is that showing a model to be consistent with data has, is in no way constitutes a test of the assumptions used to derive the model. Okay, what, what I mean there is there's a, there's a phenomenon in mathematical modeling called equifinality. And what that says is you can take two absolutely contradictory models in terms of the assumptions you put into those models about the biology and have those models end up making exactly the same temporal predictions under a wide range of circumstances. So that yes. demonstrating a model to be able to fit the data doesn't say that the model is correctly representing uh, the dynamics in the sense that it can correctly predict the impact of policy change. 
There's a and that, is, that those alternative hypotheses will only expose themselves when you make the policy change. And what I was getting at, Carl, was the simulation modeling testing where you have a, um, we're trying to see can the model re uh, represent, the, you have a true representation of a system, you sample from it, and then you test for the model can, can uh, replicate that. That's kind oh, of I see. So you, yeah, that's called model reference. Yeah. So the idea is you build a model that you you call an, we call it an operating model, one that you uh, that represents what you, you're going to call truth about a, 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 a fake world that is a reasonable world. Yeah, I forgot to mention that. And then you ask whether or not you can recover that world, the world that you specified in the first place, if you start from somewhere else. Yeah. Or can and that, you approximate that world in various ways? Success that's an interesting thing about this paper here. We actually were trying to do that in this paper here. Uh, so we had, we did, uh, it's Entropy Bay again. We defined a true world with that. And then we sampled from that true world and we saw whether we could replicate the distribution of species. Uh, and the true, and for instance, the true world was based on having some um, environmental preference functions to distribute the various species spatially. And uh, when we then did the sampling, so we took samples from the map we looked at what was in those and we took those samples with or without sampling errors. And we looked at, can we replicate distributions and can we, based on that, say, what are the preference functions that um, determines where the various species are? So that approach has some nice methodological aspects to it. And it actually, well, here is the, a representation of how it was done. Um, Hold on, let's see, we need to be a little bit more clear here. So you set up a, an operating model, a reference model using environmental preference functions of some kind that you chose. Yeah. And then you ask whether you can look at uh, the outputs of the model and figure out what the functions were that you put in in the first place. Yes. Right. Okay. So this is not saying the operating model is correct. It's just saying, can you figure out what the operating model was from examining something about its behavior? Mm -hmm. um, I think we should go down some down somewhere, some figures here. So this is for cart in Anchovy Bay. This here is the underlying true distribution for, for cart in A in the A plot. Then we sample 200 out of 1600 cells with no uh, sampling error. And uh, we get in this, and then we look at the environmental preference functions. We derive the environmental preference functions from those 200 cells. And then we get this kind of pattern. Uh, we can then, or we can do it from, from uh, more, all cells with or without sampling errors, and we get something that's closer and closer. I think I'm confusing things here. Um, this shows the, the environmental response functions. There are five of them for card depth, temperature, salinity, proportion of cell that is sand bottom and dissolved oxygen. And the curve with color underneath it shows the actual distribution, the true distribution from that was used to derive the, uh, the distributions in the model. Then we did the sampling and we came up with the stippled lines here. So something that was quite similar. Anyway, um, I was just reminded. Well, the, what were you sampling? So you were sampling densities 
Density uh, uh, is simulated a density is a cod. Yeah, with and or those, without sampling error. So why did those simulated densities differ from the densities that you used to distribute them? Is it, is, so like what were your, where your mouse is now, uh, there are no cod in the upper part of that uh, yeah. function. Is that because be they were constrained by some other variable that was no, very- No, that's important? because there were no, in, in the actual, uh, it was using this, this, this distribution for cod, but in the actual ecosystem, there were no temperatures over 18 degrees. In the, so uh, therefore- in, in, the re in, the, in the model, Oh, I see. In the operating model, never generated high temperature. Yeah, in the entropy bay, there were oh, okay. this warm water didn't exist there, and therefore uh, we got a, a, a curve that was truncated to the left. Okay. What's going on down in in E there? Why e, is the actual distribution falling away? Is it because other things besides Factor I, E or other things besides DO or limiting. It could also be a question of the uh, that there were uh, relatively few cells which had the high uh, oxygen uh, content, dissolved oxygen. Most of them would be in that three, four, five range. Uh, range yeah. So do, do you do you folks all understand what Bill is doing here? Uh, this is a really mm -hmm. interesting kind of way of studying habitat linkages and habitat preferences is quite different from the, some of the statistical nonsense that's appeared in the recent ecology and biogeography uh, literature is incomprehensible stuff. Should we explain that Carl based on, on, on this or on the flow diagram? There are some in in the in the aerospace model. There are uh, there's a way of distributing things spatially. That's this EWE model that's here on the, on on the left. That's our operating model. That's the true world model. That's what we assume for now. So we do a run with this. We have our response functions. We have our food web model, and we have environmental drivers. So for cod, we have five drivers: depth, temperature. Uh, hard bottom salinity and oxygen. That's what it prefers. So we do a run, just an echo space run, and based on that we get a biomass distribution that we sample that we take at some point. So that's one way of doing it. Uh, the other way of doing it is that we we uh, we do a run. We're still using. No, we're not using those response functions. That's actually not correct. We do a run. We, sorry, we sample the biomass distributions. I'm getting confused. I haven't looked at this since 2014, I think. Do we really do it? Okay, you, you do a run, you sample the biomass distributions. Yeah. Okay, then you- Oh, okay, yeah. Then you do what, a bunch? Th this is our sampling that goes on here. We do a run, mm -hmm. we get the biomass distribution, we get the abundance out of that, we put a sampling error, we can do it with a sampling error. That gives us some abundance for um, spatial cells. And we try a different number of spatial, how many, how many samples do we take? Based on those samples, we make the response functions. So we predict how these response functions can, uh, would be. And then we make a predicted one. Again, we use our full web model with environmental drivers. So maps of temperature, maps of oxygen, maps of depth. We make a run, we get some but new with the, But with the estimated response function. With the no, estimated, no. we estimate the response functions. We do oh, not okay. use the original response functions for this. Oh, okay. We estimate them based on sampling. That's what this says, now I remember it. Yeah. We compare those biomass distributions to come out of the predicted runs with the original. And that is our, our test of how the model is doing. So if you scroll down where this is going to fail you, where that center box is going to fail you, fail you, fail you is in uh, situations like box E, the oxygen effect there. 
where there appears to be a, a negative relationship between biomass and oxygen at high oxygen levels. Oh, that's the temperature. Or it, no, is E the no? Oh, e. e. E is dissolved oxygen. Oh, sorry, I thought I thought it said B. No, yeah. See how they they seem to avoid or not do well in areas of high dissolved oxygen. Well, what what has to be going on there because that they are not avoiding high oxygen areas, fish never do, is that they're avoiding something else that is correlated with high oxygen levels. So the basic problem with this, this approach that you see is that it, it's not really accounting for covariation uh, uh, among the, the driving variables. So, uh, so oxygen, high oxygen level is correlated with what? Low temperature, right? Uh, yeah. and, and, po and possibly uh, low salinity. We should be able to see that also from A and B because depth and temperature are very much co correlated. Right. So the, it's not, yeah. Well, the, high, the, the lower, if we look at A, it undersamples the lower part here. Right. Which is the part with the highest temperatures, which is what is missing when you look at B. Anyway, the, I'm pointing, I was, we, I brought this up, this paper here, because the approach here for testing the model is a general approach that can be used for any model. That you're working with, yeah. and it's on that's being this testing is being used a lot, and it's really critical if you have people coming out with results that they actually have tested whether it's doing what it's supposed to do. This here is one step that can be taken to at least explore that, if you use this kind of uh, of testing here. You know, I think, I think the basic problem here is that mo most human beings, me included, would never use the, uh, the word test in this context. A test implies something like a hypothesis test or something. Uh, that, that's not really what's going on here. This no. is, a, this is uh, an, an evaluation of the capability of an estimation scheme to recover information. Yeah, short and tested. Yeah. <laughs> it's okay, Carl. You see, you give, you give I'm not a native break. speaker. You, you know give that. Them a, a few minutes break here. <laughs> ten o'clock. Good idea. It's ten o'clock, uh, and we've covered this. Let's uh, let's take a uh, the five minute break, and uh, when we come back again, uh, just explore what we'll do. But it could be that uh, we. Um, we open up Ecospace and we talk about what's in there. Okay, I will uh, stop for five minutes. Oh, yeah. Okay, we're back again and uh, let's just look at the uh, Ecospace and uh, we're going to kind of do tutorial nine for this. And I have opened here the echo part model that was downloaded from tutorial nine. So any model of any version of Andrew B model was actually going to be quite fine for this because we're going to be constructing the map and everything from all the steps that are involved in this. That's my suggestion. Uh, but let's just go and first see if there are any questions from you and then we'll, um, I've opened the model, I've gone to EchoSim, and I'm just running EchoSim. What's happening here? Oh, I wasn't in it. Now that's better. So 50 year run, and we see things happening. We see cut going down, we see whiting going up, also down whales and shrimp are going up. And that's because we have some things in EchoSim and some of those things will be carried over to EchoSpace. I just want to see it's not totally crazy. It's not, it's much, pretty much in line with it. Cod is uh, going down because trawler effort and whiting is going down because trawlers increase effort. That's okay. Um, 
So let's go to echo space input. We can actually just, if I go up and I, I take a model here to start it off, just to show you. I've opened echo space from up here, echo space input output. We can do exactly the same. We can go in and we can run it. You see it runs pretty fast and what's in it, we can see from the map. So here we have maps uh, for the various groups that show the distribution in space. And the maps are arranged. So the color scale here indicates that uh, where the green soil, let's take the green in the middle here. Uh, that's uh, if you had the same, if you have the biomass distributed equally across the map, all of them will be this intermediate green. That's roughly one. And then the, so this scale here is from zero to two. If it's double, it will be up in that red here. So for anchovy here, you see it's really concentrated in this intermediate depth zone band up here in the northern part of the street of the Gulf uh, and the Bay Anchovy Bay. So that's how it looked. Now, when we ran this, you also noticed, oh, this in very, very dynamic pattern there, which is an interaction between zooplankton and phytoplankton that also results in detritus being produced and, and removed uh, pretty actively here. This is an artifact that you're seeing here. Um, which has to do, I'll go back to echo part, input, basic input. The uh, original entropy bay model just had a, a productivity, uh, but not a biomass or not a, and hence not a, a PB. And I just totally, because arbitrarily said that Given that the productivity was 240 gram carbon per square meter per year, I put those 240 down there as, and then a biomass of nine because nine is the conversion factor from gram carbon to gram weight waste. And the very high PB is what results in um, aerospace being unstable the way you, you, you saw it there. Hang on, before you go on here, Billy, there are uh, there are uh, models of phytoplankton and zooplankton interaction out there that argue that the dynamics, the fine scale dynamics like that, should be dynamically unstable. But there should be these pretty violent localized predator prey oscillations back and forth between phytoplankton and zooplankton. So, yeah, this, this although this is a numerical artifact, it is. Uh, it's a warning actually that there may be complex dynamics like that going on on time scale shorter than the one month step being used to, uh, to do the eco sim, sim simulations. It's not, and it's not really what we're looking at in that model, in this model here. We're not into soil plankton, fighting plankton dynamics and interaction and so on. So in all the calculations, what we are using there is the product of these two is the production. So I can get exactly the same production if I go 18 for biomass and 120 over here. And I go back to Ecospace. See if it will allow me. Yeah, it allowed me to go back there, just like that. Just run it again. And you see now the this dynamic is, is, is gone. So we don't have these wild fluctuations there, which were not spatial fluctuations, but really month to month things happening very, very quickly. So that's a little bit left of it, but not, not much. Anyway, now we have a model. Um, so I can continue now with uh, showing you how you create a spatial model, but I'm also wondering if there are any questions from any of you based on what you have been through. Not really. Well, let's see if I can let, remember. Let me what? mention one other little side thing is that a capability that you haven't seen yet in ecospace is to have predators move towards uh, areas of higher prey concentration towards areas of higher fitness. 
right now the predators disperse just in relation to habitat, but there's an option for you to set it up so that they, the cod, for example, would be moving in the direction of higher uh, biomasses of herring and sprat and things like that. Or, and, and there's a parameter configurations for that that predict the same kind of spatial instability that you saw in that phytoplankton. They predict the development of these frontal, these fronts of prey that move along being chased by the predator uh, and so on. And uh, those, uh, some of those uh, structures are actually observed in pelagic systems uh, where the predators are nuking the prey and the prey are moving on and the predators are moving, trying to keep up with them. So we got don't, a little... don't assume when you see an instability, a spatial instability, that it's a wrong prediction. Generally, no. Okay, um, we got a little bit um, enthusiastic side, enthusiastically sidetracked by in that discussion about the two ways we have of distributing things. So let's look at what's done in this model here before we, we do it for the next one. There's this habitat-based foraging, where for each group you can say, do you want to use environmental responses or and or habitats, so you can use both of them. So in the model here, we've defined, I go to maps now, I go to habitats down here. Uh, so here we have the various habitats. We have a coastal habitat. We have a sand habitat, it looks like this. So this is coastal, this is sand. Then we have rocky, which are these ones here. You can see that over on the right here, rocky is, these ones, and then we have the deep water. So these are defined here as four habitats. Uh, in the models I've been working with, I'm increasingly using the habitat capacity model to distribute things instead. But in this model here, just for, for, for the demonstration, we've actually done it so that zooplankton, phytoplankton, the tritis are based on these habitats and the other on environmental responses. Uh, that's not much logic to that, it's really to demonstrate to you that it's possible, just as it's possible to, to do like this, you can have, you can use both. And there may be cases where you want to use both. Um, I would say though that what I tend to do more and more is to, when I work with this, to use the elemental responses to distribute things, it uh, often works really well, and then use the habitats, still have the habitats but use them more to distribute fisheries so that in, in the here that maybe the trawlers will not be working on the, um, uh, on the, in this hard bottom here, maybe they're not able to work there. Maybe the trawlers won't be working in deep water because it's too deep for them and, and so on. So uh, it's nice to have the flexibility of having both ways of doing it. If we are using the habitat Oh, for these groups where we have using the environmental responses, so the habitat capacity model, we then um, have to define, not there, but uh, here, we define some, um, environmental response functions for each group. So in this model here, cod is distributed based on a depth function, and a temperature function. And where are they? Well, I think that's where it gets really confusing. They are here, but you actually work with them in ECOSIM here. So here, depth cut is this one here. I go to what we worked with a week ago, uh, ecosim environmental responses. And here there is the depth cut that is being used for, for that. Um, it's being carried over to aerospace. I'm just hesitant here because I might be jumping too fast. Even though we, we covered this, that's one reason why I tried to jump a little bit fast. Yeah, just Let's as a warning to you guys, 
Billy has a couple of grad students that are using these functions, right, to try to, to distribute things in eco space models. And it, it's a really steep learning curve. <laughs> yeah, it's taken them a long time to figure out how this stuff out and how, where to find it and how to get reasonable settings and stuff like that. So don't expect that. You're going to immediately. It, this is going to be obvious, and you'll be able to run off and use it this afternoon or something. It's not that way. It's pretty complicated stuff. It's pretty complicated. The tutorial is, however, a really good help for getting it. And one of the things we really want to get across is that uh, it works pretty well. It's not that complex compared to much else. Uh, many other types of modeling that are used for, for, for this. And it can be taken very far because of the, uh, because not, not the least because of the temporal spatial framework where you can change the maps for every time step. So in this case here, for instance, the depth card uh, in the echo space, it's applied here to an environmental driver map called depth. So if we go and look at maps, you can see here there are environmental drivers. Uh, actually, that, <laughs> that is confusing. There's temperature at that distance. There's no, there's no depth. Where is the depth? Well, well the depth is so depth, crucial depth that it's a base map. Depth is always there, yeah. Yeah, it's always there, uh, basically. So that's a base map that uh, we're using here. So this map here with depth, um, uh, it can actually be changed every uh, every time period. It's not the most obvious one. If we take temperature instead, that's an environmental driver. It makes more sense to think about that you would uh, that that's one of those that you would change over time. And that's what what is that's uh, the temporal spatial framework opens up for changing these maps. So this is a, a, a way of addressing a number of questions that relate to temporal spatial changes such as, of course, climate change. But let's, uh, let's try to make a model. All right, aerospace is the green world up here. We want to have, oh, we want to have a new, so I, I if I click on this one here, I have various options, including create new aerospace scenario. We have one that's called that uh, already. So we're going to do some title here. I often call them scene one and scene two, but sure, I'll say that. So now we created a new ecosim Echo space scenario. You can see up here that if I click the down arrow button, it's FIS 501 test that's loaded. So let's go and look at what we have now. Maps, whoa, that's pretty. We have nothing. Of course not. So let's get something. Edit base map. Let's say we want 20 cells. 20 rows and 20 colors. That makes for 400 cells. And the really good advice is don't make pretty pictures when you start working with this. You, if I had made it 200 by 200 instead, I could have made some really pretty pictures and I, but I would have had 40,000 cells to work with. And while Aerospace can handle that for the global model, we work with 160,000 cells or something like that it gets slower. It takes minutes to run instead of seconds to run it. It can even take hours if you get up to 160,000. Uh, and you don't, it's difficult to play with that. So what we often do with these models is that we create them and then we extract the information we need and put it on maps using a GIS system or something like that. And we make two versions at the same time. So, um, the grad students that uh, Carl was talking about that work with echo space and environmental preference functions, uh, they all have two, at least two or three definitions 
map definitions that they work with. And they might work with the cross one to get everything sorted out and so on. And when everything works nicely, then you can start using the final solution for the production runs and, and make the pretty pictures that are good for communication. And, and you, you don't really learn very much from having those higher resolutions. So course maps, fast runs is the way to go. Otherwise you're wasting your time. So we, we start off now, we define number of rows, number of calls, 20 of each. And I'm going to add one more thing here, which is cell length, which is not 0.5 kilometers in, in this model here. I'm going to make it uh, just for the sake of it, 20 kilometers since, since I was trying it up there. That's no argument for that. It's just suitable size. I know how big uh, Anchovy Bay is, so it's a suitable size for this model here. Yes, now we have a map to work with. Here we are, that's our map. Um, oh, we could read in now um, depths and so on, or we could just make it. So depth, I'm going to say out in the deep, it's going to be 300 meters out there. I'm going to just sketch it. Come on, water, 300, here we go. I'm going to go 200. Hello, talking to you. What? I don't think it got it before. Oh, come on. Well, I can do that. No, still doing that. Well, those damn programmers when you eat them. Come on. This is not fair. I smoothed it down here. I have no idea what's going on here. It's, I should be able to do this. Uh, it's not working. If they won't have been here, I would say, damn programmers, what are you doing? I have no idea what, what is this. Uh, this uh, is something we, oh, now I can do something here. I'm going to make some land here. Come on. Maybe a bit of smoother. Okay, we have a map now. That was not very convincing. Uh, what you should know is that uh, you can go edit base map up here on the right, up in the top there. I click on that and that's not the place to do. I take that back again. Uh, I can double click on depth and I get these values. I can, uh, if I have a CSV file, I can now import a CSV for a comma separated value file from Ecospace, from, from Excel uh, that I can read in. It can also be ASCII grids, uh, which, is, which are georeference files from a GIS system. So we can read in all of these maps. In the interface here, we can just do one of each kind, one depth. Uh, but if you're using a temporal spatial framework, that can be for each time step or they can be uh, at specific point in time. So now we have a, um, we now have a depth. Actually, I could have, if I'd be a little bit smart, I could have gone to the, um, 
in the um, in the tutorial. There was a link to um, a, a spreadsheet which had like that. I just copied and pasted the depth from that spreadsheet that you could download and uh, apply that. That's it. Okay, now we have the map that's uh, used for the anchovy bay. So it's very easy just to get them from a spreadsheet and cut and paste them in. Um, we have that now. Okay. So now we want to parameterize the habitat capacity model. Let's see, we go Ecospace, input, habitat-based foraging. Oh, we actually have those maps in Ecosim too, forgot that. Didn't have to go for Ecosim. And uh, we're going to add a response curve. So here we add one. So we're going to make a depth distribution of a species uh, for, for something here. Really? One yeah. quick question. You said um, we have this, um, these graphs here also in Ecospace. Do you have to like reload them or they automatically transfer no, no. when you have them in Ecosim? The maps from the other scenarios or, or, or from where? You're talking about the maps again? No, 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 just these curves here. These graphs? Yes, do they automatically um, appear there or like do you have to load? They are, they are used, uh, they you are part of the, they're part of the database. They are used for all Ecospace scenarios. So because I already had them in the model, they are here. Uh, because we don't expect the depth of cut to vary based on the scenario. If you want to test those, then you'll have to have uh, version A and B and C and D, and but they're all going to be in here. That's a practical way of, of doing it. What I want to do now, however, is to show you how to make them, how to define the axis. So for that, I've added an environmental uh, preference function here. And I'm just going to sketch how it looks. So it's something like uh, it, it could be something like this. That that's uh, my that's my function here. It's just a shape. I could uh, I could go to Aquamaps and I could get a depth preference for the species I'm looking at. That's how we'll do it. But you can also just do it like this. If I click values here, I can say uh, depth testing. Oh, come on. No, okay. Sometimes these buttons are not. So I couldn't do that. Okay. I couldn't change this, this title here. Um, but we have a shape now, but x, x axis is from zero to one, defined foraging response. So let's try to see what happens if I go in there, depth. Okay, x minimum and x maximum. Okay, we want 400 meters. And now going out of that field, you can see now the x axis is so that uh, the their preferences between 100 and 200 and from zero to 100, it occurs, but anyway, that's my, my funny shape. And uh, that's basically it. Okay. Um, next, I can start thinking about applying it, but let's go to group capacity model for that. Oh, we're using habitat for everyone even though we don't have any uh, habitats. So that means that we haven't defined anything. Remember, this is a, a blank scenario. We can, we, can, we can do that. What we can say for cart, let's use environmental responses instead. So we are distributing cart now based on this, uh, this uh, function, depth function we just defined. Um, I said I want to use it. 
have to 14 views, apply 14 responses is here. So, so over on the left there. And now you can see now I have one environmental driver map that's depth because that's the only one that's defined that depth is, is hardcore to always be there kind of, don't, it's not necessarily defined, but it's a, it's a default base one. Um, if I click this, moving too fast. If I click the, the cell here, depth and cut, it brings up this graph here. In here, you can see on the left, all of the response functions that have been defined. And it's the last one here we want to, uh, to use. So I'm going to move that over to the right. And uh, what you see on this histogram here, that's the depth histogram for the map that we read in before. So uh, on zoom all, there we are. So uh, cart will not occur on, on the many uh, shallow parts of the, of the bay, but it will occur throughout this distribution. And what from this, we can see that we are in the same ballpark that the, um, that there is, um, you know, that that's not a ma mismatch mass. If, uh, if this had, uh, if all the depths were between zero and 20 meters in, and we would know from looking at this that, oh, that this, this doesn't match. So, okay. So now we define for card, use this environmental response number 10 for it. And that is in here. What? No, I took the wrong one. I took depth, shrimp and ventus. I don't want that. I want the one from down here my own. It now looks like this. Okay. And now it should say 10 there. Come on. There we are. So let's go and run it. Map, run. Oh. They're dying out. What happened to cart? Why did we lose them? Something is carried over from Ecosim. Even here. So even though I went straight to Ecospace here, I still have my Ecosim scenario loaded. So I have my new ecosim scenario. And in ecosim, I have fishing effort. Patrol is increasing. So that's what we see over there in ecospace. We can also go in here and we can look at fishing effort and run it. And you can see now the trawlers where they concentrate. Oh, they're spreading out because now the effort is increasing. So they're fishing more and more and more. It's just effort is increasing. That's why, uh, that's why it's, it's been jazzed up to higher, higher level. So now in, in the end, they're fishing everywhere because there are so many out and that there are so few caught left at this point. Well, they're not only increasing, but they're also targeting the cod. So the overall effort is being concentrated in a smaller, in a small area there. Especially when you start here, if you look at it here. Yeah. I pause it. Yeah, see how that effort is just taking all the effort from the whole spatial map and moving it right into the areas where the cod are. So even in year one, it's generating an exploit fishing mortality rate about three times higher than it should. Yeah. So show them what happens if you just fix that, uh, that relative effort thing. Well, I can, let me just do it in a, in a, in a sim slightly different way. I'm going to go to fishing effort. I'm going to reset it. It's still put it back in. Trouble's going to yeah, start. No, but that, that's exactly what I want to show, Carl. Okay. 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 So now we go run the Ecospace again. Stop. Run because we want to do it. So in this case here, 
the fishing effort still concentrates in this area here. Actually, let me do one thing more. That what I should have done was run EcoSim because I made a change. You know, my default is always run EcoSim. And cod, you see flat lines in EcoSim. So effort doesn't change. Cod is almost flat lines here. So what happens in in EcoSpace when we run it here? So we're taking the same where we just concentrated the trawlers and the cod. Uh, here, uh, relative biomass is here. And we have, oh, they're not doing too bad, Carl. See, they're just going to. But you must have a fairly low fishing mortality rate then to start with. Hmm. Yes. And I have for cod, I have also a fairly low vulnerability so that makes them more stable and, and able to be to more productive. Feel. Oh yeah, very, yeah. very productive. Those are. Yeah. So they can actually cope with it, uh, almost cope with it in echo space. Um, we can, we could, if we increase, uh, this vulnerability here. So I'm saying they're further from carrying capacity. And we run EcoSim. I'm sorry if I'm confusing you now, but uh, it's just because it's a, uh, oh, cut. Cut now starts to decrease a bit, but not much. If we run EcoSpace now, you should see a stronger reaction. And you see here our EcoSpace is going further down. So Ecospace reacts more strongly now than Ecosim. The reason for that is in the fishing effort is more concentrated. So I want to show, look at fishing effort. You can see how it's how it concentrates on that. Um, it makes the it makes the fleet more efficient. That cod are concentrated, and that's. That's reasonable, but um, it should not. Ecosim and Ecospace should give the same here because it's the we're just making it spatially explicit. But there is this effect. We can we can deal with that in the in Ecosim Ecospace input fleet side dynamics. Ecospace input fleet size dynam fleet dynamics. Ecospace input. Ecospace fishery fleet dynamics. There's something efficiency multiplier. So for trawlers, uh, maybe that should be point, I'm guessing here, 0. 0.7. One Ecospace. What? Oh, that's cats. Oh, now we've got too many cards. Carl, you, you are, uh, I hadn't planned on talking about this. Oh. You're confusing us. About what? Anyway, now you can see uh, card is in here now. So we have, uh, we, 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 uh, this, is, this is good enough. Card is almost flatlining and very similar to actually to echo sim. So card is goes down that much here. In echo sim, it goes down that much. Quite similar. And, and, and uh, you got to watch out about those graphs. The graph on eco space is a log scale, isn't it? Oh, no. uh, echo sim See, the is eco -sim not is, log. Echo sim is an arithmetic vertical axis. Yeah, it's look at the eco space there. That, that's going from one to ten. Yes, you're right. Yeah, Point you, one to can, ten. Can you give? Can you, will it let you scale that to arithmetically? Or? So no. the it, 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 eco space seems to be giving less variation, but it isn't. It's actually giving about the same amount of variation as eco sim, but it's being plotted with a different scale. Yeah. I don't know why that's anyway, 
this is just an artifact of that. It's um, we, we're good with that now. So let's see what else we have. Um, well, we basically have a model now that uh, is behaving kind of okay for COD. Um, maybe we should try the, the trick about the uh, putting in a protected area. This is, was, this is what Echospace was designed for originally. So, Echospace input, Echospace fishery, marine protected areas are nothing because there aren't any. Define MPAs, let's do that. We don't have any, so we're going to make one. MPA one, create it, okay. We have an MPA. Maps. Um, MPA is here. Hmm. I always have to say those damn programmers whenever I can get an opportunity to say those damn programmers. So they're putting in a fishing net here to indicate that it's closed for fishing. Logically, the fishing net would be everywhere else, but it still is kind of nice that this is close to fishing now. That's what, that's what this means. You can actually go up here and you can, I think you can select your own, um, your own, no, you can't, not for this one, for many other things you can. So this area is now closed for fishing, is it? Well, let's go back, marine protected areas. We have a marine protected area, closed for fishing, yeah. And you can have it closed for, uh, in only uh, parts of the year, that's fine. Uh, we want to close completely. MPA enforcement, all MPAs are enforced. That's fine. So it's going to be enforced for trawlers. That's the only thing we care about. For the other ones, it doesn't really. Actually, we can say it just for trawlers. And it's not going to impact anything else. Um, you don't have any bycatch. Eh? No. Oh, just cut and whiting. And where are they allowed? We can get them to fish everywhere. That's because we don't have any habitats here defined in this model here. Um, let's see what happens when we run Ecospace now. So maps, remember where the MPA is. Uh, I can actually show you MPA there. We can just look at card. That's the one that's impacted. There we are, show the MPAs. Well, now you see the MPA, now you don't, but you don't see any impact of the MPA. How come? Well, let's look at fishing effort. Uh, we need to look at it for trawlers. So there is no fishing effort in that MPA. And it's a fairly large MPA. It's 80 kilometers by one, two, three, by 100 kilometers. But the fishing efforts have been increased outside the MPA. So the effort has been reallocated rather than removed. It has indeed. But the impact of this on, just to non cart. Okay, on cart, you don't see it. We started by talking about this. Al's question only when we started the class. Dispersal, right? Dispersal, yeah. So let's look at that. Echo space input. Um, what's in here? One of them is dispersal. So the base dispersal rate is 300 kilometers per year. Now, this dispersal is um, not the same as migration. Dispersal is if you go out and you uh, at a certain point in space, a uh, certain place, let's say you uh, tag, or many places, you tag in an ecosystem like Anchory Bay, 
you tag uh, at 10,000 cards on a given day and you know where you release them. And then you come back a year later and you find those who are still alive of the 10,000 and you know exactly where they are. The distance, the average distance that they have moved in that year, same day, so it's not migration, it's not seasonal migration, that's the dispersal rate. That's what we're looking for. How much do they disperse? Not migrate, but how much do they randomly disperse over such a year? Uh, if they disperse 300 kilometers per year, which is a default assumption here, default assumption, it's a estimate, whatever parameter, whatever it is. Um, then that means that in a year, they're going to be dispersing 15 cells in space because there are 20 cells. So let's change that to something that let's cut instead stay in uh, around, not move that much around. So I've changed that to 10. I run the aerospace now. And this demonstrates that MPAs has an effect if they stay in it. Let's see what happens to graph here. Oh, we have spillover effect now. So COT uh, is actually reproducing, doing well in this uh, area. And because of that, they spill over to the neighboring areas. I can see some of you sitting there thinking, this is a really critical parameter. Allow me to interpret what, what I think you might be thinking. This is a really important parameters, but how on earth am I going to get that for my model? Does, what do we do? Well, and that is the $64,000 question. We need to have estimates for those dispersal rates to do this properly. What, to be able to evaluate the efficiency of the MPAs, we need to have a good representation of this. That's not an, an aerospace issue at all. That's a data issue. That's a ecology or biology issue uh, that we're talking about here. Try once more. Well, once more, and we're 1053, so we're actually getting pretty close. Do we still have them building up? Yeah, they're still building up. So they, we could make them spread out a bit more. And uh, but anyway, you can see you can see what the impact is of this. Um, yes, Natalie. In terms of dispersal rate, would it be something that's more species specific or location specific? Certainly species specific. Um, I don't know, location, what are you thinking of or location specific? Like if say, I don't know, the topography of the area or just local adaptation would cause some population of a species to disperse differently or at a lower rate. Or maybe local um, food availability. Well, local food availability is something we can uh, keep track of in here, which is not the case here. You know, all for, right now for all the other groups, it's flat. As, um, uh, there's a, a, a rule that almost all really large populations in nature uh, fish populations have uh, two sub kind of creatures in them. They have migra a migratory component, like the cod that migrated in and off the shore of Newfoundland uh, and produced the huge fisheries in Newfoundland. And then there's also a resident component uh, of individuals that spend their entire lives in local bays or local areas. If you go out in the pelagic ecosystem, you find yellowfin tuna. There are local yellowfin populations around various islands that never, they complete all their lives around those islands. 
and then migrating past and through them are these huge elephant stalks that move way north and way south every year. So it, uh, you, you, the answer is, it isn't like some areas or some populations. It's, it's that almost every creature that has a mobile component also has a sedentary subpopulation component. They often get wiped out under fishing. So you could fishermen have... know where they are and they wipe them out. They target them and wipe them out. Now, after these 20 years of development, there is a lot of uh, ways of handling various issues. Uh, for instance, we could say we could make cod migratory. Uh, there are some parameters there, but uh, what I want to show is that we would then go to go in here and then on the migration for cod, we could define where they are in January, February, March, April, and so on. And that can be done with envelopes. Uh, for instance, Fanny Couture is working with a rather complex model looking at um, south, uh, southern western killer whale and competition with all the marine mammals. And she is moving her southern western killer whales with migrations from month to month. So where are they in the different months? Uh, and it's feasible. Uh, you, you can do a lot of this kind of, of tricks with it. I'm actually thinking when we get to the, um, given that it's 1057 now, when we get to working with the models, I've asked uh, some of my graduate students to come and give a really brief presentation. So we may, we may get family to come for 10 minutes to start a presentation just to give an idea about how she's working with the model. Uh, maybe Megan will do the same for 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 and, and a few others. So you'll get a, some real brief presentations, including of things like this as we move along as to start off some of our discussions in the last three, four, four weeks of the class. Um, anyway, we've created a simple model here, um, put in a momentum preference function. Put, up, uh, put in a, a closed area and looked at the parameter that all predictions about efficiency of marine protected area really are, um, that's really critical for all questions related to this. And I think that's pretty good, well done in, in 50 minutes. It does not need to take months or years to develop this kind of things to start looking at it. Indeed, what we've done in this hour, I think, is a model for how, how to deal with, with, with uh, um, approaches to ecosystem modeling that get it done quickly and see how it works and then improve it and then improve it and then improve it. You'll learn a lot from, from just these simple things. That's what we'll be doing starting next week, um, defining simple models and working with them. Any questions or anything else before we round off? I'm going to, while I remember, stop the, uh, ooh, if I can find it, stop the recording. Thank you, you all, first for today. Stop, Carl.